So I wanted to tell you all a bit more about what we've learned rolling out our vision and robotic systems to waste facilities over mainly Europe. Um, and to keep this concise, I want to mainly focus on the considerations that went into the vision system components. Um, some of it will dip into the robotics, but it's mainly going to be about the concepts for vision systems. So first up, I just like to clarify a few terms because uh, there's plenty of buzzwords around the industry and they get confusing. Um, so first up, uh, we have the most general term, artificial intelligence. Now, as far as I can see, uh, this seems to be applied just about anywhere. We have a computer system making decisions uh, in a human-like manner. Um, and this can be as simple as just some hardwired but sensible behavior, like uh, turning lights off at night, something like that. Um, I think partially because of uh, the marketing associated with it, it gets somewhat overused. Um, so the proof in the pudding is if it times like the following are used. So next up, we have machine learning. Um, now this is a bit more of a specialized set of statistical tools mainly, uh, and they're used in many, many industries. Uh, so we have financial forecasting, we have anomaly detection, we have web weather modeling, we have all kinds of stuff. Um, machine learning is pretty general. Next, uh, within machine learning, we have deep learning. Uh, now these are a special class of models uh, that mimic how the human brain is wired. Now the analogy uh, for using them uh, that I like comes from Andrew Ng, who's uh, an acclaimed scientist within the field. And he said, uh, I think deep learning is akin to building a rocket ship. You need a huge engine and a lot of fuel. If you have a large engine and a tiny amount of fuel, you won't make it to orbit. If you have a tiny engine and a lot of fuel, you can't even lift off. To build a rocket, you need a huge engine and a lot of fuel. The analogy to deep learning is that the rocket engine are the deep learning models and the fuel is the huge amounts of data that we feed these algorithms. So next up, we have computer vision, uh, which is just the study of understanding images and videos, um, but in its full generality, this turns out to be really, really hard. So following the analogy, this is one of those fields that benefits from uh, huge amounts of data and very clever models. So how is computer vision used? Um, it's currently being used all around us uh, in many, many situations, uh, mainly because it's good at dealing with the very messy real world. So for example, um, we have traffic control recognition, we have crowd management, you can detect people in a crowd, track them, whatever. Um, you can do text recognition in images. Um, there's plenty of other examples, but here are a few that have automated uh, real cities today. So how do we apply all this? Well, uh, we can provide waste facilities with cheap, lightweight vision systems that they can retrofit into their plants and train models to detect waste. And here we see the output um, of the models on three different lines. So we've got an aluminium line on the left, a PET line in the middle and a paper line on the right. Um, now, I just want to point out a few things about these predictions. Um, so for each box that we predict, uh, we also get a confidence. Uh, now, this is the confidence that the model thinks that it is correct. Um, and I'll touch on this point later, uh, just because it's quite useful. We can do very a lot of other things with this. Um, also, because the models learn to see in a similar way to the human eye, as long as there's visually a difference and we have the data, we can train models to classify the waste. And that means that we're able to work with things like food grade versus non-food grade waste. Uh, we can do material type, we can do brand level. Um, and here's just some examples of the flexibility of the system. Wonderful. So how did we do that? Um, I mentioned before that you need a lot of data to train these models with any reasonable accuracy. Uh, so the first task for Recycli was to try and get a lot of data. Now, unfortunately, um, there wasn't really a data set that existed for this. So we built one um, and what we produced is called WasteNet. Uh, now it's, we believe it's the world's largest open source data set uh, of over 3 million images and it's still growing as we're adding in more images from clients. Um, we also have synthetic waste and we have brand level waste and this has often been produced uh, via our partnerships with Imperial College and TU Delft. Uh, so yeah, but that wasn't the end of what we needed to do. We needed to actually deploy these into real facilities and put them to work. Um, and when we went about this, uh, we immediately ran into some quite interesting problems. Now, first up, 
um, when we first deployed our models, we noticed that we were getting these tiny, really fast moving detections throughout the night, uh, all apparently tissue paper, um, and it was just buzzing about. And when we looked back through it, of course, we just saw that, you know, you're going to a waste facility, which is smelly and full of waste. Uh, and so there's flies everywhere. And it turns out that throughout the night, uh, every so often, one of these would be detected as a fly. So uh, we wanted reporting accurately uh, for clients. Um, and so we needed some way of throwing away these detections. Um, and one thing that we found that was worked quite well uh, was to exploit the fact that we don't want any detections when the belt isn't moving. So we built out a module within our vision system that just tries to predict frame to frame movement within the image. And if it can't see the whole belt moving, then it just discards all detections. And that got rid of that problem, which you know quite neatly wrapped that up. Second up, uh, still on an animal theme, um, we had a situation where we'd started recording images regularly uh, whenever we detected anything. Um, and we checked back over Christmas break, expecting to see a whole load of new data come in. And the first thing that we saw was this little picture of this cat snuggled up on this belt. Now, um, what we have deduced has happened uh, was a lonely cat walking around over Christmas break, looking for somewhere cozy to sit. And it wanders into this waste facility and finds the one light still left on uh, and it snuggles up under it as cats are wont to do. Um, giving us plenty of pictures for our informal ML team mascot. Um, finally, we have our uh, local celebrations and habits. Now, this is um, an interesting situation where obviously our models are only as good as the data you feed it. And this became a relevant issue when we deployed to our first aluminium line model, and it was in Northern Ireland. And uh, we'd done a scan, we tested it, and we found that it was only really working on a subset of the data and when we looked at it it was only really doing anything sensible on guinness counts and so we went back to the data to try and figure out what was going on and it turns out that we'd accidentally scheduled the scan for the week following st patrick's day and so almost all of the cans on the belt were just guinness cans and so our model was only really good at detecting these um, now what we needed to do was just you know do another scan a month later and that kind of even things out but still to this day our aluminium models are slightly better at guinness cans than they really should be so we've deployed our systems we've got that working um, and now we can start to see the benefits of it so here we have a little table comparing some of the trade-offs between um, other sorting systems within facilities. Now, first up, we have human sorters, which are you know, high quality, expensive, needs maintenance. Um, and whilst they're good at sorting, uh, you can't get the large scale live granular reporting from them. Um, we also see comparisons to near infrared, which whilst uh, reliable um, is very, very expensive hardware. Um, now, the nice thing about our AI is now that we've made WasteNet and we've trained the models, we just need a webcam. So it's actually pretty cheap per unit to roll out. And because it's so flexible at detecting anything uh, that you, you train the models on, we can get material level, we get brand level, we get item level. There's no real limitation within the technology to that, whether is in near infrared. Wonderful. So um, I'd like to, well, we made all of this and then we applied it to some robots. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about that process. So uh, when we applied it, we were able to achieve um, pick rates of above 50 picks per minute on all of our lines and providing solid output purities. Um, at this point, I'd like to add a little bit of nuance onto these numbers and some considerations that went into them. Now, uh, when reporting, most of the industry works off of the pure metric of picks per minute. However, when we deployed our robots, we found that optimizing only this wasn't quite what we actually needed. So um, we were there making a prioritization scheme for the robot, trying to tell it what it should pick when. Um, and the fastest thing to do was always just pick the first available item because this minimizes downtime and so increases our pick rate that we managed to report. However, when we were working on lines such as, as this one, um, we found that we had a wide range of added value per pick. 
Um, so I just want everyone to take a look at this image and see that we've got some shredded paper, we've got some tissue paper, we've got PT tray, and then we've got those nice big juicy P, uh, HDP NAT on the right. Um, and so when we're picking on this line, we find that if we just pick, pick the first one, um, you know, when you get shredded paper, there tends to be loads of them. So just because there's so many, often that ended up being first in the priority. So we need some way of prioritizing the actually valuable items because it wasn't really adding much to pick all of this really light stuff. So what we did was we implemented a system that first prioritized the classes. So um, HTTP NAT being worth plenty of money uh, is obviously the first thing that we pick. Um, and also then we prioritize the large items first. And so from this, um, we still managed to achieve pick rates of over 50. However, uh, it was suddenly worth so much more to our clients. Um, the next thing I wanted to touch on is why not use accuracy as a metric? Now, um, whilst this is a much more common metric within the industry, I, I just want to point out why it doesn't paint such a full picture for waste detection. Now, the first point is that accuracy is the relevant metric when you absolutely know that you're looking at exactly one object you're just determining how often your system classifies it correctly. However, waste uh, is very often piled up, as we see here, on, for example, on this front end line. And so it's not really that obvious uh, for an algorithm to tell one where one object starts and another one ends. And I think that's reasonable looking at this image. It's kind of tough to tell, like to pick out each individual uh, bit of paper, for example. Um, so to improve on this, we commonly work with purity and efficiency. Um, purity is just how accurate we are on the objects that we detect and efficiency tracks how many objects we are correctly identifying. Now, an important point about these metrics is that we operate with a trade-off between the two. Earlier, I mentioned that the models identify each object along with the confidence that it's correct. Now we can choose to only accept predictions made above a certain confidence threshold. And by varying this, um, for example, increasing it, we can accept only the very confident predictions, thereby increasing the purity, but decreasing the efficiency. And when we look at all of the different confidences that we can plot, we get one of these curves. So you can see that at high confidences, we're in this kind of top left region where you're very pure, but maybe you don't have such great efficiency, i.e. you're not picking as much. Um, and if we drop the confidence, then we get a nice curve as it goes around to lower purity, but getting basically everything on the belt. Um, and so what we do is we generate these plots for each client and we just talk them through um, where they are on the curve. Uh, we get this per class um, and we talk through what's possible for their needs. Uh, for example, if they need 97% purity, then we can uh, up that and lower the efficiency, perhaps whatever works. Wonderful. So uh, just to summarize um, the key points I want you to take home, computer vision's everywhere, but not particularly easy. Um, so we developed WasteNet uh, to train very clever algorithms on cheap hardware, which now keeps the cost per unit low, whilst having plenty of benefits. Moreover, there are plenty of ways that we've found that we can add value that go past the industry standard metrics. Um, we found these just by working with waste for a long time um, to find, for example, that the picks per minute isn't quite the only metric that matters when considering robots, um, and also that these purity efficiency trade-offs uh, can add a lot of value to uh, your output streams.